Disclaimer, please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk, then play at half speed. Thank you. So, um, what are we working on this week? Legs! Got it. Okay, Josh! Today, we're going to try some basic parkour. Now, I need you to jump from where you are to that ledge over there, then over here to us. Got it? Um, are, are you sure a skyscraper is the best place to do this? What are you scared of? You have that bungee cord? You fall, it catches, you'll be fine. I even measured it out myself! It's nothing to worry about. I got it completely under control. Is this revenge for throwing you off the building that one time, Tom? Because if it is, I am very, very sorry. Noted! Now jump! Oh my god. I got him, I got him. Okay. You can do this. You can do this. You can do this. All right! <laughs> We're gathered here today to honor our friend Josh and spread his ashes. Oh, 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 I'm going to stop you right there, Dan. Um, we don't have any ashes. Uh, so we're just going to toss some of his stuff over the ledge. Oh, okay. Well, um, that works. So what do we have? Um, let's see here. Um, not much, really. Just, um, this is all he had in his desk. Just Kleenex, lotion, empty lotion, empty Kleenex. Full Kleenex, full Kleenex boxes and lotion, what? Oh gosh, it's, it's, it's growing from Josh's stuff. It looks like... No, no, that's definitely a person. Hello. That's Josh, as a kid. What are you? Why do you look like Kid Josh, Kid Josh? My kind are pure energy. I use some DNA to create this body. DNA from the box. Oh god. Gross! Gross! I have come here to document life, then destroy. Well, I'm just gonna ignore that last bit. Alright, well, you're on Earth now, Kid Josh. Um, so, what do you want to do now? Yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. Kid. You're almost there, so I don't want to see you give up yet. I know Xander Berkeley and Heat is looking scary, but I want to see you tear right through him on your way to Robert De Niro and the Untouchables. I want to see you get mean against Charles Martin Smith in Starman. Otherwise, you'll never make it past Jeff Bridges in the last picture show. But... If you got the guts to take on Sybil Shepherd in Taxi Driver, then I know you got the heart to go one on one with Joe Spinell in Rocky. Now get in there! Step into the squared circle every Tuesday at firepitpodcast.com as Dan, Tom, and Josh start on their marathon to Pound Town. Taking on all the heavy hitters, going the distance against the heavyweight champion of boxing films, Rocky. Rocky. It's hope. It's heartbreak. It's haymakers. And it's here here at the fire pit. You're a wrecking machine. Good evening, bots and listeners, and welcome back to the fire pit. I'm Tom, star name, Star Thompson, and tonight we've got another heavyweight contender coming down the entryway as we continue our marathon to Pound Town. We've already felt the heat and brought down Al Capone in an untouchable fashion. So what's next for the fire pit? Maybe some romances in the air. Hmm, maybe. But as per our rules, we've taken an actor or actress from our last film and moved them on to this one. And now, to tell us more about what we're watching and who we're watching, I send the signal over to Nigel. Thank you, Tom. Star Nigel here, American named Dan. Last time out, we watched Charles Martin Smith help bring down Al Capone, played by Robert De Niro in 1987's The Untouchables. Tonight, we'll follow Charles Martin Smith to 1984's Starman, 
a sci-fi romantic drama starring Jeff Bridges in one of his earlier roles. To give us a bit of a rundown on this film, though, and maybe some box office numbers, I'll turn things over to Josh. Why, thank you, Dan. Josh here, space name Star Reginald. And as mentioned tonight, we are watching 1984's Starman, starring the aforementioned Jeff Bridges, along with Karen Allen and Charles Martin Smith. Second time this journey, we've gotten to a film the three of us haven't seen. So, Starman had a release date of December 14th, 1984, has a runtime of 115 minutes, a budget of $24 million, and wait for it, wait for it, a box office return of $28.7 million. $4.7 million net profit. Ooh. So if we're taking into consideration advertising costs, ooh. Yeah, if it followed the standard protocols of doubling your budget and using that. Probably not in 1984. Yeah, probably not in 1984. But uh, even if it was like $5 million, which isn't unheard of, it probably did not uh, make bank. But it had a Rotten Tomato score of 85% with an audience score of 69%. Nice. But an IMDb score of 7 out of 10. Meh. But yeah, like I was mentioned, it was released December 14th, 1984. It did not premiere at number one its opening weekend, believe it or not. Actually, no, believe it because, you know, it's not that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, do you guys, like, so it didn't even premiere in the top five. No shit. Yeah, it premiered at number six its opening weekend. Do you guys care to take a whack at the number one movie that weekend? 1984, uh, it was on its second week of release. In December of 84? Yep. Your only hint is it's not Lethal Weapon. No, but it's Beverly Hills Cop. Thompson? I'm going to follow Dan's lead here. I'm going to say Beverly Hills Cop. You are both correct. It was Beverly Hills Cop. Woo! Beverly Hills Cop premiered at number one that weekend, or no, yeah, number one that weekend on its second week of release. It grossed eleven point five million dollars. That sounds low. It's nineteen eighty four in December. Remember, nineteen eighty four December wasn't uh, a draw like it is now. Like they like to release stuff in December nowadays. Since was it the Force Awakened was released, they realized, oh, December can make money. Yeah, there's a whole untapped market there. Yeah, oh. but at number two was Dan's absolute favorite movie, Dune. It opened that weekend as well. It was its first week of release. It pulled in $6 million. And number three was a movie called City Heat on its second week of release, pulling in $4.3 million. And a movie that was set like 24 years into, the, or 26 years into the future, 2010, the year we make contact. Oh, that was the one with um, the guy from Jaws. Was it? I wasn't... I've never heard of that movie, but that pulled in $4.1 million. And at number five was another familiar film, The Cotton Club, pulling in $2.9 million on its opening weekend. The Cotton Club. Yep. From Orion Pictures. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But uh, Starman premiered at number six on its opening weekend, grossing $2.8 million. Other notables in the box office. Interestingly enough, there was some good movies in the box office. The Terminator was on its eighth week of release at number eight, pulling in 955,000. Now, maybe not critically loved. Let's just say it was a terrible film. But at number 11 was Supergirl, pulling in $402,000 on its 13th week of release. Was it really? Was that really released in 1984? Yeah, it 1984. was. 1984. Number 12 was Amadeus, pulling in $399,000. That's actually a movie I really want to get to someday. Same. And on its 28th week of release, at number 13, pulling in $240,000, Ghostbusters. And how many weeks has was it 28th in the 28th week of release. Ow, oh, wow. It was still that high up. Number Good. 13, yep. Because remember, if you listen to our Ghostbusters 2 episode, um, that was episode 50, if I recall, 30 episodes ago. 30 episodes ago. Jesus Christ. Um we talked about how Ghostbusters 2 only lasted one week in the box office at number one, whereas Ghostbusters, the original one, lasted like 13 weeks in the box office. It's first eight weeks at number one. It makes perfect sense that it's on its 28th week of release and it's still in the box office. Yeah. Ooh. But really, I looked at Starman's last week of release. Mm -hmm. Beverly Hills Cop was still number one in the box office on its ninth week of release. Ooh. 
And this was February, the weekend of February 1st, 1985. Mm-hmm. So this was February Hills Cop's ninth week in release. It was uh, Starman's eighth week in release. So there really uh, isn't a major change. <laughs> All the big name movies are off the box office, but there's a bunch of other films that I'd never heard of. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's not a lot for the box office in that regard. It's opening weekend was interesting, but it's final weekend was not. Yeah, we're we'll getting talk about going into February. By that point, it's like dredges. Yeah, box office is a very different place back then. Mm-hmm. But uh, that's all I've got for box office info. Um, Tom, what do you got for the production? Well, I've got a few things for the production here, team. So let us talk about Starman. Tagline. He traveled from a galaxy far beyond our own. He is 100,000 years ahead of us. He has powers we cannot comprehend. And he is about to face the one force in the universe he has yet to conquer. Love. Summary. An alien takes the form of a young widow's husband and makes her drive him across the country. The government tries to stop them. It's weird that the tagline does a better job of summarizing the story than the summary does. (laughs) General info, um, this one's an original story screenplay, not adapted from anything else. It was purchased by the studio at the urging of executive producer Michael Douglas. Not a lot of stuff going on in the background in terms of like creatives, but behind the camera, we've got some familiar names here. This movie was produced by the Michael Douglas, known mostly for films like Romancing the Stone and Wall Street as an actor, but he's actually backed some highly rated dramas. Uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Made in America, and a movie we almost wound up watching on this journey, Double Impact. <laughs> we came close. Yeah, very close. Also producing this film was Larry Franco, who backed a few films from our past journeys actually two of our favorite films from past journeys tango and cash and the thing so we know what he brings to the table this movie uh with them is a writing team of bruce a evans ampersand reynold gideon uh returning writers from another loved film from our field trip to kingtown stand by me which is a film they would write after this. This was their first film that they wrote, um, and one of their better ones. With them was Dean Reisner, who uh, was an uncredited, because he rewrote a lot of the script. This was his second to last film, uh, with a uh, career going back as far as 1939. Uh, mostly Westerns in TV and movies, classic Westerns like Bonanza, and the modern Western, Dirty Harry. So this guy knows how to clean up a script. And directing the film, a returning director to this podcast, John Carpenter, who we remember fondly from The Thing. He's not a stranger to sci-fi there either. He's done films such as Dark Star, They Live, and Gorgon the Space Monster. So a a little bit of sci-fi experience that he's bringing uh, behind the he camera. He directed They Live? Yeah, he, he did. Directed, yep. I was not aware of that. That's yeah. interesting. That is the one with the sunglasses, right? Yeah, yes. that's the one and Roddy Ruddy okay. Piper and the whole I'm here to kick ass and chew bubblegum and I'm all out of bubblegum. I'm bubble all gum. out of bubblegum, yep. yeah. Great film. I hope you can see it here sometime. But we have some returning faces, a returning face in front of the camera. Um, the two main stars of this film are Karen Allen and Jeff Bridges. Karen Allen playing Jenny Hayden, a performance actress. We remember her from our destination film, Fire Pit's Wings Into Adventure, Indiana Jones. She's also done a few sci-fi roles herself. Seminal classics such as Terminus with a 3.2 star rating and Ghost in the Machine with a 4.6 star rating. So she knows how to pick her sci-fi roles. Which Ghost in the Machine is that? Is that the, uh, or is that not even the one based off the anime? That is not, that's Ghost in the Shell. Oh, wow. Ghost in the Shell. This one doesn't look much better, I'm going to say. Oh, okay, I know which one you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's that crappy, like, uh, crime thriller that came out in the 90s. Yes, like a um, serial killer goes into the internet or something like that. I mean, it's got Willem Dafoe. uh, Yeah. So the casting, it doesn't look bad, but woof, everything else. 
But with her, of course, Jeff Bridges as the titular Starman, a performance actor. This is his first time on the podcast, but I suspect not his last. And this is not his first sci-fi film. Care to get take a guess what his first sci-fi film he's ever done was? Tron. Yeah, Tron. Yes, Tron. That's yes. <laughs> yes. It's like it's Jeff Bridges. Oh. Dude. He's not some no-name actor no one's ever heard of. Right? <laughs> he's also done K-Pax and technically... I mean, if you squint Iron Man, I would technically count that as kind of sci-fi. Guy builds a mech suit. I mean, yeah, I mean, he was. That's definitely science fiction. Yeah, yeah, it's not. Yeah. yeah, I would count Iron Man as a science fiction film. I mean, I, it might not be in the genre, but if somebody was making an argument, I'd, I'd hear it. Yeah. So we got some. They both have some sci-fi skill with them. Also, in this film, we have our connector Charles Martin Smith, Robert Phelan. Richard Jekyll and George Buck Flower. So pretty decent cast. Some with some sci-fi experience, um, hit or miss, uh, depending. Now that we know who's making the film, Nigel, would you happen to have some trivia about the film? Nope. Sweet. Cool. I'm eating pizza. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, actually, um, there's a little bit of trivia on this. Not a whole lot. Um, at least not. Some that'll keep me talking for 20 minutes or whatever. I'll I'll have some trivia as we watch the movie about some of the scenes that came up. But um, one of uh, everyone's favorite bits when I get to trivia is um, production stories. And now this one doesn't have the drama that didn't have a director telling the crew that they were all shit eaters and he couldn't wait to leave and go away. And they can stay and, and continue to eat shit and he'll leave forever, never come back. James Cameron, we still love you. <laughs> but, um, you know, it doesn't have stories like that. And it didn't go through like five or six different directors. But this film is kind of, um, well, it's a case of you almost had it. The original script was purchased by the studio, the urging of executive producer Michael Douglas. Uh, shortly before the studio, the same studio optioned Steven Spielberg's Night Skies script. Um, screenwriter Dan Reisner came into the project in late 1981 after director Mark Riddell left due to the artistic differences with Douglas. Reisner worked on seven rewrites of Starman with six different directors, but did not receive a screen credit in the film because, according to him, the Writers Guild, in all their infinite wisdom, decided I didn't contribute 50 percent of the screenplay. I don't think Jesus. he's. I don't. I don't think he's bitter at all. Um, I wondered why he wasn't credited. Yeah. Other uncredited writers who worked on the script were Edward Zwick and Diane Thomas. I, I don't know what they're they're famous for, but it was, this was in my notes. Um, Columbia decided to abandon Night Skies, which was in similar plot to Starman at the time, on the grounds that the former story was more Disney-like with a gear towards children, whereas Starman was more of a mature audience. So Night Skies was sent off. Uh, eventually, that script was rewritten and retitled E.T. the Extraterrestrial, huh. which then went on to become the highest grossing film of its time. <laughs> Upon which Reisner commented, well, goes to show how wrong you can actually be in this business. So the too long didn't read version is uh, Columbia Pictures bought the rights to Starman and Spielberg's Night Skies at the same time. They were convinced to sell Night Skies before they didn't even think it would make it or before they didn't think it would make any money. Night Skies was then sold to another studio renamed E.T. went on to become the decade defining mega blockbuster that we all know and love today. Oops. <laughs> 28.7 million, though, guys, in the box office. Yeah. Out of yeah. a 24 million dollar budget. Yeah, no, I mean, but in another, there's a there's an alternate universe where this swung the other direction, where Starman is the more well regarded role, and Night Skies never got made into ET. You know what I mean? Like it's it's just one of those things that you just really never know. It, it's it's really is a gamble sometimes. You never know which script you're gonna green light is gonna be that mm. ET. You know, yeah. whatever. They, so they could have wound up making it into Mac and Me. Yeah. So. Um, another. Funny bit of trivia I found. Um, actress Karen Allen is seen drinking a can of Coke in her car in this movie. Um, this was very deliberate product placement because at the time, Columbia Pictures was owned by the Coca-Cola company around the time the movie was made in 1985, 84. Mm -hmm. Home video cassettes of Ghostbusters and a couple of other Columbia Pictures were released with advertisements for Coke on the tape. I actually remember this because my aunt had the original 
Ghostbusters VHS. Also, at the time, uh, Columbia Pictures, which also made Ghostbusters, put cans of Coke uh, in many of their films. You can see the guys drinking Coke when they're um, having the uh, right before they get their first call when they're. Yeah. Yeah, when they're sitting there eating the Chinese food and Ray says, uh, this magnificent feast represents the last of the petty cash. Well, that yep, whole scene, yep. there's there's Coke cans on the uh, Coke cans and diet Coke cans on the table they're sitting at. So I'm not going to lie. If I was a soft drink company and I owned a movie studio, by God, I would have them in every scene. Like it would cut away from somebody just standing there and then it would cut back to them and they would have a Coke can in hand. You know, I bag a lot on product placement in movies. But sometimes when like, they're just drinking a can that says cola, but it's it's a red can with white letters, I'm like, it's clearly meant to be Coke. It's like, mm-hmm. just just go pay Coke and, and do it, you know, or let Coke pay you. They'll give you some money for the movie. Just, you know, everyone knows what it's supposed to be. Yeah. Um, same with like when they open up a big bag of yellow chips and it just says chips on it. Like, those are clearly Lay's. Can I have a beer? What kind? Yes. <laughs> white can with black letters that says beer. <laughs> um and another bit of trivia i had uh in uh what could have been yeah jeff bridges is the main character of this film but the role was originally written with uh, uh either kevin bacon or tom cruise in mind and both of them were on other projects and couldn't do it so, so instead really? we got the dude. yeah tom cruise was making hold on rain man no 1984 that was 80. nope that was tom cruise was filming ridley scott's legend and oh, wow. I believe Bacon may have been filming Footloose at the time. These are young fellows, though. I don't know how old Jeff Bridges was when he made this movie. So he might. But I don't think he's as young as Tom Cruise was or Kevin Bacon. Wow. Probably for the best. I mean, this is supposed to be a dead husband. Was 35. 34, probably when it was filmed. Bridges? Yep. I mean, that's about right. I mean, that's I mean, he's supposed to be a dead husband. So I figure that's about right. But I think Cruz was still in his early 20s by that point. If well, yeah, that... he just did uh, Risky Business. That was 1981. Yeah. And he was a baby at that time. 1983. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, I mean, like Tom Cruise is still, this is 84, 85. He's one year away from, well, Top Gun, which is, pun intended, the movie that launched him into the stratosphere. Like, that's the movie <laughs> that made him tom cruise so yeah yeah. he was 21 years old when he made risky business wow so yeah i'm personally i'm kind of glad that they both turned those down because they were too young in my opinion but then again i haven't seen considering tom cruise was what two years removed from playing a high school student yeah Yeah. in all the right moves i think oh yeah he's a high school school student in risky business yeah and in all the right moves Ah. that's what came out after that one right i think so he plays like a football player in high school yeah today i learned (laughs) yeah Um, and uh, one last bit of trivia that I have for tonight to talk about. Uh, I've got more as the movie goes on. This is the only film that John Carpenter made that got nominated for an Oscar. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Jeff Bridges got a Best Oscar nomination for this film, but he lost to a movie that Josh mentioned was already in the box office. He lost to, uh, he, what's his name, in Amadeus. Yeah, I, was, I glimpsed that when I was looking up uh, production notes for this movie. Yeah, a rare instance where a film from the science fiction genre received an Academy Award nomination for Best Actor, Jeff Bridges, who eventually would go on to lose to F. Murray Abraham for Amadeus. Oh, I heard good things about Amadeus. So Yeah, I'd love to get to that movie someday. Um, I haven't watched it since I was in junior high. This is, Yeah, like I said, this is the only John Carpenter film to have received an Academy Award nomination. So, oh. uh, yeah. Which is weird because he's also done a lot of films that are special effects heavy. None of them have ever been nominated for special effects stuff. But um, that's all I got for trivia right now. I don't want to ramble too much. Like I said, there's not a lot of juicy meat of trivia on this film. There's not like a lot of like, uh, you know, Jeff Bridges smacked the shit out of Karen Allen during the production. Or it went through five or six different directors. Or mm-hmm. um, there was all these crazy things. It's just it's actually kind of a quiet production. Um, Let's make up something. Okay. Um um, I, I heard on this film that there was supposed to be a wild car chase and Jeff Bridges was driving a car. And, and then what happened is the brakes actually went out, but that wasn't part of the stunt. Yeah. So, so and he actually ran over and killed a man. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Then, and then when Jeff Bridges got out of the truck after running over and killing that dude. He got mad at the director and said, 
Tom Cruise could have done this in a cave with a box of scraps. This is accurate. This, it was, is it accurate? Yep, yep. There's film yeah, of this accurate. and everything. Yeah, wow. They edited that out. And then he actually, when he filmed Iron Man, he looked back for that for inspiration when he sent the line. So it was Starman that say that started the MCU. It tracks. It tracks, yeah. Wow. Wow, I did not know that. Wow. That's incredible. So anywho, expectations, Tom. <laughs> um honestly, um, I don't know what to expect from this film. I know it peripherally. I know the basic plot. Um, you know, guy gets possessed by an alien, but I really don't know what to think of this film. Is it I mean it's supposed to be a a romance? I always got the impression that it's supposed to be a kind of drama like suspense like they're trying to run from the government or something like that that might be in the story too so i don't know what to expect i'm sure it's gonna be quality though i mean jeff bridges karen allen john carpenter directing it's got solid reviews um but then again so have other films we've watched in the past so i'm cautious about this film i'm not expecting to be wowed but I'm hoping that it's going to be a good film, or at least a quality film. Um, I wish I had more to say than that, but I don't know. I just don't know. I'm going in completely blind. No expectations, except let's see what happens. Nigel, what about you? Um, I've never seen this film, but it's always kind of piqued my interest. I don't know how I've never seen it. I've never even seen, I've only, the only clips I've ever seen is like, bits and pieces of the trailer and stuff i don't know i've never sat down and watched this although admittedly it's like a romance movie and those aren't normally in my wheelhouse anyone who's listened to this podcast would know that so that's probably why i haven't watched it and then of course by the time i got to age of um dating and and putting up with those movies you know with your girlfriend or now wife, they didn't watch these films. So this film, so I've, I still have never seen it. I've seen a lot of other romance movies. I've seen Titanic and that, but not this one. So my mm-hmm. expectations though, I'm expecting a quality film. It, it does have some pretty good reviews and I like Jeff Bridges. I really like Jeff Bridges a lot. I think he's one of the best actors ever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that. And I am looking forward to seeing like an early Jeff Bridges film. Because in, in my timeline, he made Tron, and then he just made The Big Lebowski. <laughs> yeah, he went from Tron to The Dude. <laughs> and so I've, I've missed a lot of his movies in the 80s and 90s, you know. So mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to seeing that. I, I don't know. I'm expecting a good film. What about you, Josh? Well, um, I have seen a grand total of 10 minutes of this movie. My dad loves it. And I remember one time he's like, let's watch Starman. So we rented it from the VHS rental place, mm-hmm. brought it home, plugged it in. I watched the first 10 minutes, got bored and left. <laughs> that tracks. So I was probably 20 years ago. Yeah. So that's about all my knowledge is of this movie. But uh, what I'm expecting, I watched the trailer a bunch to help with inspiration for the skit. It's throwing off major midnight special vibes for me. Ooh. It feels like a road movie. At least the trailer kind of yeah. implies that. So I guess if I'm going into this, I'm kind of expecting a road type movie, you know, with hints of Midnight Special. And I know Midnight Special came out years after this one, but I watched Midnight Special first. So thus that happened first. (laughs) It tracks. It tracks. Mm -hmm. For those of you listening, if you're curious about Midnight Special, check that episode out. It was episode 27. Was it that far back? That was that far back. Episode 27. We're on episode 80. Wow. In my head, that movie feels like it should have been part of the flying high into the hero's journey and not. That was our uh, whistle stop campaign trail. Yeah. One of the highlights of that trail, too. Man. (laughs) One of the more exciting parts. That was a very depressing (laughs) journey. That was the last, like. (laughs) Happy movie (laughs) we had for like two months. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But honestly, um,. If we would have watched this movie before watching The Thing, I probably wouldn't have any high-level expectations for this movie. But now that I've seen The Thing and I can really appreciate how good that movie is, and that came out before this one. So this is like John Carpenter's next movie after making The Thing. I would have some... I've got some high expectations for this film solely because of the enjoyment I got out of watching The Thing. So I don't think it's going to be... At least I'm hoping it's not going to be crap. 
it may not be the story I'm expecting, but I think looking at it objectively, I think I'm going to like it. I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to like it. So my expectations are fairly high. Yeah, that's really all I've got. Well, you, it's interesting that you're talking about Carpenter and Nigel. You're probably going to say the same thing as me. From what I glimpsed with looking up um, production, Carpenter kind of took this film and wanted it to be not like his other films. He was trying to do something different from The Thing and Christine and all the other like high sci-fi, high special effects, horror suspense. He wanted, he was trying something new with this film. So I mean, sometimes that works for a director. Sometimes it doesn't. Kevin yeah. Smith was best when all he did was dick and weed jokes. And then he did Jersey Girl. Yeah. He's still best when he sticks to that shit. Mm-hmm. So you have high expectations for Clerks 3. Uh, let's let's um let's, uh, <laughs> pump, let's pump the brakes on that a little bit okay <laughs> yeah yeah um but you're saying that you got midnight special vibrations from the trailer that's i mean we all like midnight special right guys hmm? yeah i liked midnight special a lot and i like you know i like i said i love jeff bridges and even though she hasn't always been in some of the best movies i like karen allen the movies i've seen her in i like her in writers of the lost ark obviously yeah. I think she's great in Scrooged. Yes, yes. Yeah, she's the love interest in Scrooged, and she's oh, great. Is she? Yeah, she I've is. seen that movie once. And she's great in that film. And mm -hmm. the movie itself was hot garbage and total trash, but she's the best part of the fourth Indiana Jones film. Yeah, she's the only one that looked like she was having any fun. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I like Karen Allen. So I'm kind of looking forward to seeing this, and, and I like John Carpenter. I know he was trying to do something different with this film, but he's a good director. Yeah, quality stuff. Um, I hear the good things about the score, too. I can't remember the guy's name um, who did it, but even if the film is just like, eh, we could at least have something good to listen to. It was kind of that way with um, mm -hmm. Midnight Special, too, right? We yeah. Yeah, we like the score on that one. Like honestly, I'm I'm worried that it's gonna be slow. I think if I have any worries, I think the movie's gonna be slow. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah, it does. Because I mean, me it, look at looking back at the thing, especially relative to modern movies, you know, we always talk about that ADHD fueled nonstop action, you know, orgy. 80s movies had a very different vibe to them. Just look at the Terminator, even Ghostbusters. I mean, compared to today, there's a lot of downtime in those movies. Mm -hmm. So I'm almost expecting this movie is going to have some downtime. Uh, just given the, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? The uh, vibe of movies back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So I think that was my, probably my biggest fear about watching this one. I mean, it's in the past movies we've seen, it's not about slow it's about how that what they you do with the downtime it's what i'm not necessarily saying that's going to be bad i'm just saying compared to like some more modern films i feel like it's going to be slower than we would like it to because we're just used to it it's one of those things you know we're used to these fast-paced newer modern movies flashy mm -hmm. graphics type stuff i mean we can appreciate old films. I'm just worried that since we don't have any nostalgia behind this movie, that we may come into it and be like, okay, that was a little slow, but, you know, kind of mm -hmm. like we were with The Thing. It's like, it's a little slow, but it was awesome, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a different genre. Horror films are kind of... No, but I'm just... But yeah, you're not wrong. I'm, 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 I'm not, not comparing... I'm just comparing... Uh, like, I, I, I get that they're different genres and everything. I'm not... It's like... I'm trying to make it apples to apples. Yeah, mm -hmm. I see what you're saying, though. Yeah, but I'm trying to think of other modern films uh, that kind of fit this one's template. I mean, road movie, romantic, maybe a little more slow. One guy's an alien. I can't think of anything that is parallel to that that we can. Yeah, well, I mean, this it. is uh, I think we talked about this in uh, Wimbledon. I, I think I talked about how I liked movies, like especially romantic comedies that kind of have a sci-fi element to it like mm -hmm. maybe not direct sci-fi but some kind of supernatural element yeah you know like i think i quoted serendipity in that one the john cusack film yeah but that was um a terrible movie well actually no, i've never seen all that movie i'm thinking of a different cusack movie that was terrible go on but uh i didn't hate that movie it wasn't one of my favorites but i liked that aspect to it and i think they played well in that one and if this is just a romantic Comet, it's probably not gonna be a rom com because rom coms were really kind of perfected in the nineties. Um, like a romantic film with a sci fi element, I could get behind that. Like I said, I have no idea what I'm getting into. Mm -mm. But um, also, it does occur to me 
Is this only our second romantic film we've seen on this podcast? Might be. Wimbledon was one, and I can't think of any others other than Wimbledon. Yeah, I think Wimbledon was our first. I wouldn't constitute Wimbledon a romance. That was a tragedy. (laughs) Wait, no, we watched Shawshank Redemption. Uh, (laughs) Yes. That one scene in the showers with the guy? (laughs) Yes, yes. That that was more romantic than Wimbledon. (laughs) But no, I'm I honestly, we this might be the first romantic comedy we wind up enjoying or romantic film, excuse me, that we might wind up enjoying on this film. Yeah, I guess uh, we'll see. Um, like I said, we don't know. Yeah, but you're like, all going to find out with us. Yeah. But that's what we are expecting. I'm curious to know what some people actually thought who've seen the movie. Well, I can tell you with absolute certainty. Not all that rapid fire typing you were hearing while you guys were doing your little bit was not me doing the trivia because I forgot. <laughs> I'm doing the quiz because I forgot. See, we don't hate the quiz section. We just hate writing the quiz section. Yes. And it's not because it sucks. It's because we always forget. <laughs> it's like, wait, who won? Please say it wasn't me who won. Shit. <laughs> yep, that was that was pretty much me right there. <laughs> so as he's typing furiously um can we milk this cow anymore josh no i've got i've got i've got it now i've got enough questions i was just um (laughs) yeah yeah so this is our 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 trivia section dan's going to be reading off imdb reviews tom and i are not privy to any of the questions he's going to be asking and me and tom is going to guess on a scale of one to ten uh we can't pick the same ones and if we're even distance apart the one who gets closest without going over gets the point if we land on the uh correct one we get two points did I get everything? Good. Yep. No, I got it. All right. Cool. So who goes first, Nigel? Uh, let's start with Tom tonight. Since Tom is the only one that still likes this segment and wants to keep it. For those listening, if you too like this segment and want to keep it, be sure to note in the Discord and on Facebook. Tyrick Thorne wanted us to keep it, so he likes this segment. So far, he's the only one who's actually said anything otherwise, so it's one to nothing. That's weird. So. Tarek Thorne's been kicked out of the Discord. I wonder how that happened. <laughs> Shut up. He's one of our, our most loyal listeners. <laughs> we love you, Tarek Thorne. Even your wrong opinions on our quiz, quiz section. <laughs> All right. Being a John Carpenter film, Starman could very well have gone into so many different directions. Instead, this is a very reserved and believable alien movie. Oh, I like this review. It's probably going to be a two star. I'm going to say eight, though. I was going to say eight. Uh, let's go seven. Josh, right on the money. It's a seven star review. Oh, snap. God damn it. Jackass. Re- reverse price is riding me. <laughs> All right. So, Josh, the next one is to you, then. This is such a typical example of the failures of the human race. <laughs> Is movie good. making, or is this talking about characters in the movie? Uh, I don't know. You don't have to answer that, because it could go either way. Um, uh, I feel like he's talking about the movie. You know, I'm going to go for broke. I'm going to go eight. I'm going to say six. Tom, Josh said eight. Tom said six. Yes. Tom is closest. It's a three. <laughs> oh, you know, I was actually thinking four, but, you know, I still got the point, so yay me. <laughs> He was talking about the movie, not the people in the movie. <laughs> See, that's why it, kind of, it could have been about the people in the movie, so that one could have flipped either way. Okay. Mm-hmm. Here we go. Tom. This movie represents a point of in Hollywood history where all the best possible elements came together to make a classic film. ooh Yeah, I'm going to say nine. Um, I'm going to say ten. Josh, right on the money. That's a ten-star review. <laughs> yes, I'm so happy. <laughs> Yeah, Josh is one more away from winning it. <laughs> Two more. I can do this. I can do this. Head in the game, Tom. Okay. Uh, Josh, this next one is to you. The year is 1984, and somewhere at a Hollywood board meeting, someone said, Hey, wouldn't it be hysterical if we spent $22 million on a movie where Jeff Bridges plays a head-twitching, mentally challenged robot-like alien with magic balls? <laughs> Uh, uh, one star. (laughs) Fuck you, two stars. Josh is doing trivia next week. It's just one star (laughs) review. God damn it. Shit. (laughs) I'm getting shut out again. Son of a bitch. No, and you didn't get shut out. You got one. 
Yeah, you got one. Well, technically, we still got the fifth question, but there's yeah, no way ask, Tom could win it. Okay, yeah, here's the, here's the last ways. one. Year Put him out of his misery. All right, Tom. Tom. Year after year, I wait. Now someone is doing a remake of the classic sci-fi film The Day the Earth Stood Still, which pains me. But there's still no sign of a Starman sequel. What? Is he... What are they... Nine. I'm going to say nine. I'm going to go eight. Tom would have won that to ten. Nice. Okay, okay, so I would have had... I have two points. I yeah, you, yeah, you got two. One. You, you would have got two points. Yay. Thanks to two. I would, say, I would say, even though it's a probably a good movie, and it has a high rating on IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes, that the fact that this movie made three and a half million dollars up on its uh, over its budget, or I mean three and a half million dollars, is probably why there's not a Starman two. So okay, this is the bonus question. I take it. No, 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 no. I'm answering. I think those. that's just Dan's thoughts on it. I'm uh. answering. I'm answering their question. They're like, why is there no sign of a Starman sequel? And I'm like, because it made three and a half million dollars and it cost twenty two million to make. Well, Hollywood has, has a tendency of making sequels of films that lose 20 well, it's like one of those things dollars. the thing was not very well received but it had a massive cult following so it made sense for them to effectively reboot it in 2011 because it was a not a popular ip in its day but it had become cult status right so. and and i don't think the sequel or i mean not the sequel the remake of the day the earth stood still is any is that good of a movie but the original Day the Earth Stood Still is one of those like pinnacle science fiction films made. Mm -hmm. I mean, like there's so much inspiration that has branched off of the original The Day the Earth Stood Still that I can imagine why Hollywood execs would be like, we should remake that movie. Yeah, and not, it's such and not a big Starman. movie and it had been like 50 years, 60 years since they'd made it. Yeah. yeah. And who knows? They might remake Starman someday. I don't know. Whatever. Anywho, what's the uh, bonus question there, Nigel? That was the bonus question. Oh, say it again. Tom, play the music. <sighs> Welcome back to another extraterrestrial episode of the Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and GS11 SETI researcher, Tom. Uh... Weather balloon, weather balloon, satellite designed to look like a weather balloon. Oh! Oh my god, I think we got it. I think we got it. A real live, honest to god alien! Oh, wait. It's just a bunch of balls. Tiny, cold balls. Really wish Josh would stop laying them everywhere like he does. But thank you for laying around here with us at the fire pit. We're keeping our eyes on the skies and the prize as we hit the halfway point of our marathon to Pound Town. Just a few more laps to go, then we get to go for that championship that is Rocky. But speaking of going for things, let's see how things are going for the team right now. I just feel that Josh isn't, um, he just isn't there anymore, you know? It's been like a week and, you know, it's just not the same as it was before. We were hoping you could provide some therapy to help, you know, get him back to the way he was. You do realize I'm a marriage counselor, right? Yeah, well, you're the only one our insurance would cover. Are you gonna help us out or not? I do need to state that this past week has been incredibly educational. My kind will enjoy subjugating your species and ruling over all of you. Yeah, see, he won't stop saying shit like that. So he thinks he's an alien? Oh, no, 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 no. He's definitely an alien. Yeah, see, when we were spreading his remains last week, some alien energy wad came down and clothed him from his wad. It's, you had to be there. A simplistic description, but accurate. Yeah, well, see, he can move stuff with his mind now and blow up all kinds of things. Um, we took him to a strip club a couple days ago and had him explode all the toupees the guys were wearing. It was kind of hilarious. Now, qu quick, real quick, Dan. Was that even legal? I mean, he is technically only a week old. Mm, in dog ears. The male of your species were most displeased. Oh, God, not this again. The human male incursion of shame without their upper epidermal peely growth is fascinating and worth study. 
Yeah, see, now he's just spouting nonsense. I don't understand any of this. Yeah, Josh died a couple of weeks ago, and we want this Josh to be more like that Josh. Yeah, we have this big thing coming up in a few weeks, so we need him to be less alien y. Okay, but your friend is dead. But this is an alien that you're trying to train? Yes, yes, train, and be more like Josh. We kind of need him for the podcast. He has all the hardware. So, how long is it going to take to get his head right? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So, you three clearly have deep set psychosis coupled with reoccurring hallucinations. So, like, an hour? Thomas, what the doctor is describing is commonly known as a shared psychotic disorder. And he believes that the three of us are all in this simultaneously together. For fuck's sake, here we go again with the bad Grey's Anatomy lines. I told you this was a bad idea. Look, I think I should contact someone and refer you guys to another facility. And I'll just maintain contact with you and monitor your progress. Okay, Doc, sounds like a great plan. Why didn't you just start with that? That's a good idea. Thanks! The doctor is going to be committing the three of us to Shady Acres Mental Hospital in Tampa, Florida. Wait, how did you- Are you trying to Ghostbusters to us? Then the doctor wants to use our case as a study to publish a paper. Correct my phrasing if it is incorrect, but you want to get out of this dump? Yep, he's trying to Ghostbuster to us. We're out! How dare you, sir! This is a disgrace to your entire profession. We shall not be paying for this consultation. Oh, Dan, 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 uh, legally you can't do that? Very well, but don't expect us to pay on time. Actually, um, that's also kind of illegal, too, so we can't just, you know... Fine. You shall be paid promptly and in full. But expect only an average review from us online. Harumph! So inquiry, why did the doctor call his place of employment a waste disposal facility? No, no, no. Marriage counseling. <laughs> Is there really a difference? <laughs> hey <-o. laughs> Oh, people are going to have some opinions about that joke. But if you want to send us your opinions about that joke, or if you have other jokes that you would like to send our way, or if you want to advertise about products and services that certainly are not a joke, then feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just be sure to put fire pit in the subject line as well as the reason for your email. Whether it's to buy an ad, sell us on an idea for a journey, barter some names that you would like us to shout out on an episode, or what else you might have, and fling that email our way. From there, we'll read it. Place it on a satellite meant to let extraterrestrials know about us and our human culture. Shoot it off to the farthest corners of the galaxy and never respond. Seems someone forgot to attach a return address when sending it to space. Hmm, someone? Hmm? It's always something, isn't it? But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com, capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. Oh shit. Oh shit. Either this is Lex Luthor's latest real estate scheme, or I'm about to have a close encounter. I'm off to make first contact. I'll let you get back to the episode. Thank you all for listening, and as always, good luck. Oh god, I hope they're not the anal probing ones. Or maybe... And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. Must refrain from making sexually explicit joke with son sitting next to me. And there's the budget for this picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny because it went up in flames. Yeah, I'm already getting some very strong midnight special on this. Significantly less Zod, though. That's okay. For two hours, I'm not going to make Superman jokes. I'm going to make Iron Man jokes. <laughs> but we're watching Starman.
Sky and star man. Bright, da, 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 bright da, 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 like da, da, stars da, da, can. I don't, yeah. I do know the rules. Oh, well, for your information, pal, that was a yellow light back there. I watched you very carefully. Red light stop, green light go, yellow light go very fast. Yeah. <laughs> I don't see anything wrong with that, yeah. you guys. <laughs> That's about right. <laughs> that yeah. seems accurate. Yeah, yeah. That, that tracks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can't get the engine started. Tony Stark did it in a cave! <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get some mileage out of that one. That's just like your opinion, man. Is that Frank Sinatra? Oh yeah, it is Sinatra. What's funny is if we went with my list, we would be watching Manchurian Candidate right now, starring Frank Sinatra. If we'd gone with the list that Dan wanted me to go with, we'd be watching Double Impact right now. I will never forgive you guys for not going with that list. Then you pick up I-40 westbound at Albuquerque. Yeah, we don't want to make a wrong turn in Albuquerque. You won't believe the trouble we be in. You want to know what kidnapped is? It's being forced to drive all night with a gun pointed in your side and not knowing where you're going or what's going to happen to you when you get there. Oh, it's not going to be bad. We're just going to go back to my spaceship where I'll drug you, strip you, and dissect you. See, it's not bad. It's not bad. Okay? Science is good. Yeah, science is good. I don't know why you're being unreasonable about this while I point a gun at your head. Ma'am, when am I going to get my hand Stop! Shaped? Stop! <laughs> Stop! <laughs> no, no, but, uh... You eat that last. Sandwich first, dessert last. Why? <laughs> buddy, buddy, humans have been asking that question since dessert was invented. <laughs> Better get out of those wet clothes. What icing problem? <laughs> <laughs> Bad. Is it amazing that Jeff Bridges is playing an alien and still playing better humans than anyone in Art of War? Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, no, it's not surprising. No, yeah. no, no, not at all. <laughs> Jesus, he just said warning shots. And I thought the government was bad in E.T. Do you know who or what you were kidnapped by? He doesn't want to hurt anybody. Really, can't you just leave him alone? Ma'am, I work for the United States government, so no. I understand the reproductive process as you know. You want practice? Colin's no longer sitting with me. <laughs> if you're in some kind of life-threatening situation, defend yourselves. And otherwise, wait for the feds. That's the way it is. Yeah, well, it doesn't have to be that way. I got a hunch. This might just develop into a life-threatening situation. Ooh, yep. This, yep, this, they're cops. <laughs> I want you to try this cherry cup. And if you don't like it, you don't have to pay for it. I hate it. Oh, nom, 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 nom. Oh, I hate, hate it. it. I need some more. I hate it. I gave you a baby tonight. A boy baby. He will be human. The baby of your husband, but also he will be my baby. I'm not paying child support, though. This guy's got it made, too, because he's supposed to die in a couple of days. So I was like, <laughs> I'm off the hook, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many questions that I'd like to ask you. I hardly even know where to begin. Is there anything I can do for you? Not shoot me out of sky. <laughs> Too late for that. What the hell ever happened to good manners? We invited him here. You are a GS-11 public servant. Anytime that becomes too much of a burden, you can go back to Cornell and let's see you make it through on an instructor's salary. Now shape up or get out. Sir, when the rest of his friends get here and they're invading us, I'm going to show them exactly where you're hiding. Shall I tell you what I find beautiful about you? The boobies. Now, tell me again how to say goodbye. Zip. <laughs> <laughs> and now, back to the episode. Well, Space Cadets, that was Star Man. And judging by a lot of our silence through our film, I think we all have a few thoughts about it. So I believe Josh... What did you think of Starman? 
I totally called it. <laughs> <laughs> the, you, you did. You did. <laughs> it is very much a uh, the 1984 version of Midnight Special. But I'm not saying that as a negative. This was, I really liked this movie. But I did call it. I thought it was going to be a road movie, very similar to Midnight Special. I thought it was going to be slow. But as Dan pointed out, slow and boring are two very different things, especially in movies. And I got to say that this is definitely a slow movie, but it's not boring. They definitely did an amazing job with the downtime in this film. They did a great job of building up these characters. I still can't get over how much I loved Jeff Bridges in this movie. Like, he did a great job um, playing a parrot. (laughs) Like I said, it was a little slow, but it wasn't, like, boring slow. I'm just, I'm repeating myself. I'll have more to talk about, but I'm going to keep it short, I guess. So, um, Dan, what about you? What would you think of the movie? Um, This movie surprised me. I thought it was going to be a good movie. I didn't think I was going to enjoy it this much. Part of me's pissed I've never seen this before, but the other part of me understands that Kid Me probably wouldn't have liked it. So, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, this was a good film. Um, I'm really glad that we watched this film tonight because uh, I got to see exactly what I wanted to see. I really wanted to see another early Jeff Bridges movie. And he's awesome in this for basically playing a human trying or I mean an alien trying to understand human emotions for the first time he's definitely the prototype for data from star trek the next generation oh yes but um yeah he was really good in this film and karen allen was really good i think she's better in this film than she was in raiders and i love her in raiders of the lost ark yeah she did a oh my god she did such a good job yeah you're right yeah she really anchored this film because you know bridge's character can't or doesn't understand emotions yet doesn't can't really portray the full spectrum of emotions, but she can and does. And she shows all of them in this film very well from total heartbreak to happiness, to falling in love, to grief, to, I mean, she did really good. Um, I can't say enough good things about Karen Allen in this film. I am genuinely shocked. She didn't turn out to be a better star or like, we're not speaking about her in the same breath as some other actresses like Meryl Streep. And stuff like that. Because she's really freaking good in this film. But uh, yeah, I just really enjoyed it. I I just can't say enough how much this movie surprised me. And it's just how much I really enjoyed this film. Um, I'm going to ramble a bit. So I'll kick over to Tom until ready to converge with group thoughts. And I'll continue. But Tom, what about you? Yeah, yeah. I think um, I could go on for a while about Karen Allen's performance too. But I think I'll save that for some of the merge thoughts. I'm glad that we saw Midnight Special before we saw this one because I would have probably unfairly spent the whole time watching that and just playing compare contrast. Like, oh, it's just did this because Starman did this and so on. But man, this really was such a well done film, especially from Carpenter in a directorial sense. It was, it had kind of a, not a horror movie vibe, but enough of an atmosphere where it felt mysterious all the way through. There was a haze, even in the daytime shots, it just seemed suspenseful without being intensely suspenseful. It was very well done in that regard. It's really hard to nail down because I see a lot of other films, especially Midnight Special, that try to do it the same way and you know, definitely takes from the same template. And the the lighting he does to show mood and atmosphere without being expressive, the sets and how everything just feels so real. It was an incredible job. I know he took this film because like, I want to do a character film for a change. I don't want to just do grotesque, you know, people's chests turning into mouths and eating people. I just want to do something simple. And he nailed it on the head. Wow. I would recommend this film. I I want to watch this film again. This was an amazing job. The only, I guess, nitpick would be the early special effects, the transformation into star man but that's me nitpicking a 1984 special effect well i mean come on yeah we were two years removed from the thing and i honestly i i got john carpenter vibes out of that scene mm, oh yeah carpenter vibes 
I love this film. This was a good film. It's, it's a great palate cleanser from Untouchables. I walked out of that one just so disappointed in this one. Like, I didn't know what to expect, but it beat those expectations. So I'm going to now take a step back and we're all going to meet in the middle. And I'm going to start by saying Karen Allen to echo both of you guys. She carried this film. Not in a bad, disparaging way, because everyone did an amazing job. But my God, her performance! I'm, I, I wouldn't say carried, yeah, because I, I don't think everyone in the movie, other than her, had a bad performance. I said Karen Allen anchored this film, like because she, she definitely. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. I was just saying. She, I was just gonna say I, I wouldn't say carried because carried is kind of negative, meaning she was the only actor or actress in this film that gave a damn. I would say, you know. Um, Anchored. Anchored. Yeah. yeah like, yeah, I like, think that's the perfect yeah, way last to week's, it. Last week's Untouchables, Sean Connery carried it. Or you would say Robert De Niro carried that film. But this one, I would say she anchored it. Like she was the, she mm-hmm. was the one running the gamut of emotions. But uh, what were you going to say, Josh? I was going to say, uh, maybe not anchored. I would say she was definitely the breakout performance of this one. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I would agree with that. Jeff Bridges did a great job with what he did, but his character was very narrow. Mm-hmm. I mean, he did a great job at it, but I think the character itself was very a narrow character, not a shallow character, a narrow character. He couldn't display a lot of range, kind of like how Schwarzenegger in Terminator was narrow and shallow, I would say, if I'm putting words to it. Um, mm-hmm. Look at me. I'm making up character traits. I'm going to be in a textbook in 20 years. <laughs> but, um, I-, I would say that he was narrow, but you know, he had a lot of depth to him. Mm-hmm. Like he couldn't portray a large range. You had the... Uh, SETI guy, he had his role to fill, and so did the uh, government official guy, and so did all the people around him. Even the smaller roles had a lot of character, but I would have to say Karen Allen, of all of them, had the widest range. Yeah, She mm-hmm. definitely showed her chops in this movie. Like, everybody else fit in what they needed to do. It's like, this is what you need to do, you're going to do it, and you're going to do it well. Mm-hmm. But she's all like, she, like you said, she had to go through like pretty much all of the stages of death you know or grief like even at the very beginning it's like i i I know i commented when we first watched it a lot of movies nowadays like if you look back uh what was a evil superman um what was the name of that movie oh brightburn 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 thank you the very beginning of that movie the exposition was terrible because it's like um it's slow zoomed into their bedroom across a bunch of books on how to make a baby and you know yeah. pregnancy woes and stuff and then they started talking right off screen it's like do you want to make a baby maybe we'll get it this time or something and then it pans over to them trying to get it on so like, okay we get it you can't have a kid yeah mm-hmm. try to beat it into my head a little bit more yeah Whereas this one, I think it did a lot better job. It showed us that she's grieving and her husband died without actually coming out and telling us. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, bright burn, it's like they basically looked at the camera. Okay, we can't have kids, but we're going to try to have sex and hope for the, hope this time's going to work. Right. Do you get but it? I don't we're think... setting up that we're going to adopt evil Superman. Exactly. Whereas this one showed us. The only thing she even says in that scene was, uh, you don't do this to yourself, Jenny. But yeah, I got to agree. She she definitely had, like I said, the best or the breakout performance in this one. Mm-hmm. Shame on the Academy for not giving her an, a nomination at the very least. But yeah, amazing job and just amazing all over the place. I like that the tension was always there. Like we had the government chasing them, but it was what's the best. I'm trying to think of the how to phrase it, because you always felt that there was drama there was suspense but it wasn't a car chase every second or like wild explosions in fact i think there was only one wild car chase not counting the very end but still they had that sense that any minute now things could go very wrong oh yeah yeah like you know one thing it reminded me a lot of like i was even thinking about this as we were watching it you know Dan commented when we were watching terminator 2 we went for like 22 minutes without seeing the t1000 mm-hmm I felt like that this movie did a great job of that feeling for most of the movie. Mm-hmm. Like you knew that they were being tailed. Yeah, but, but they, it's like and then the villain was just scenes. right over right over the Yeah, well, you saw the villain, but I'm just saying the tension that the T one thousand brought to Terminator two. No. 
But I was saying they 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 did the same thing in this movie that they did in Terminator 2, where they established that the villains are chasing them without having to constantly go back and show the villains chasing them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the tension was there. I mean, even when the T-1000 wasn't on screen, the tension was still there. Yeah. And they did that in this movie, like, all the time. And I, I love that about it. Yeah, yeah. This is an amazingly well put together film. Damn. I, I want to try to nitpick it, but it's really hard to. There's nothing really it did wrong. This is a just damn good, damn good film. Yeah, it was a good movie. I, I would say this movie was definitely underappreciated in its time, mm-hmm. um, probably because it came out at the same time as E.T. <laughs> and E.T. was faster paced and more lighthearted, not as heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, the special effects in E.T. are better. I, I, I don't know. I guess it's, you know, I can see why E.T. was probably the bigger hit. But this was still, I mean, this was a really good movie. This was just one of those, it was like, it doesn't deserve to be called a copycat of E.T. because it's not they're not it's no. not the same film but I don't know, I was just really I really enjoyed this movie I just can't say enough how much it surprised me yeah this yeah. film was definitely more grounded as compared to E.T. we're going to do that compare contrast E.T. was definitely fantastical I'm mm-hmm. sure this had like magical balls and such but you know by having only so many you knew like there was going to be a limit on what he could could not do but it still kept it relatively realistic they still had to take cars trains it's not like he was going to magically make a bike fly or anything like that or any glowing fingers et definitely didn't have sex with elliot that you know of thankfully but (laughs) he didn't impregnate him no that you know of but yeah i i I do understand the comparisons i mean it's kind of hard not to alien comes to earth yes yeah chased by the government i mean boiled down that low yeah, they I mean, are similar movies, but they are very different movies. Yeah, and that's essentially also, he's the, trying the to get plot. back home. I mean, mm-hmm. that's a, the plot to escape to Witch Mountain right there, too. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. I, I, and yeah, so I'm, I'm not saying it's not worthy of comparison to E.T. I'm just saying that to, it's not a knockoff of E.T. Like, oh, know, it's definitely not a knockoff. No. You know. Similar premise. And that's it. Yeah. yeah. And like I said, it's definitely more adult. Like this is a more of an adult story. E.T. was more of a kid story. So, yeah. you know, but yeah, I, this movie was just, like I said, it was just really good. I'd but, say, uh, I'd ask uh, if you guys feel like this film should be remade, but unfortunately it is going to be remade. Is it? Is it? Yeah. So, um, in April, 2016, the Hollywood reporter reported that Sean Levy will direct and produce a remake by Arash Amel and Michael Douglas will be, on as producer. So I'm honestly was, not that disappointed in that. I I'm anxious. Know. I'm curious to see how well they do, especially in today's climate. It's like one of those things. It's like, well, w- which uh, movie did you talk about? Like Flight of the Navigator and... Yeah. What was that other one? Uh, Flight of the Navigator is one. No, there was and- another one that you guys recommend. You, you said Last it's like... Star Fighter. The Last Starfighter. I am genuinely shocked in this day and age where video games are even more mainstream now than they were in the 80s that The Last Starfighter has not been remade. I'm just absolutely shocked that someone in a Hollywood boardroom hasn't said we need to remake this film. Cause it's like those three movies I'm including this one in that those are like sci-fi movies that have a fairly unique plot line. Mm-hmm. This one is more unique in the way it was told. It's like, why not remake these? I mean, they may hold a little cult classic status, but mm-hmm. those would be the good movies to remake, you know, remake the bad ones and make them good or remake the ones that were not hits and yeah, make them hits. Honestly, this is a movie I, I'm not surprised has been remade or is going to be remade because um, we've been saying this for a while. We've said this in a couple episodes that I wouldn't remake the monster hits. Like, I don't think you can remake the Godfather. Mm-hmm. I don't think you could remake the Godfather or Casablanca or, you know, those movies, but Starman, I mean, it, it underperformed in the box office its first time around. So maybe a remake might, you know, mm, boost it a yeah. little bit. But I, I on this one I disagree because you know they would have to shoehorn in some kind of obvious message. Um, no, look at it. No, look at this way though. What are the best Marvel and DC movies? The ones that they didn't give a shit about the uh, plot, right? Like yeah. Aquaman, Wonder Woman. Shang-Chi, those movies where it's like, oh, they're not our A-list characters. So Mm -hmm. they let the director actually do their job and the writers Mm -hmm. and they didn't have to start shoehorning stuff in. I think that when they get to the shoehorning, I think that's when there's more money on the line. Yeah, and I agree. Um, But I look at this and I see what they did with the remake of The Day the Earth Stood Still Mm -hmm. and just how they tried to shoehorn in like an environmental message 
and other things. Yeah, but the original Day the Earth Stood Still was an anti-nuclear weapon message. Very uh, clearly uh, anti-nuclear weapon. So Cold War for sure, but I mean, you do make a point, but it was better done. But that's typically what science fiction does. Science fiction always takes a problem that we're having today and puts it in a science fiction alien or something context like it, it, day the earth stood still was about anti-nuclear weapons a, a lot of episodes of the early star trek series were anti-racism anti-war kind of um sentiments uh later star trek episodes like the next generation all that did with stuff with like lgbtq stuff and all that you know it's like they take problems that we're having today and deal with it in a uh, fictional setting so that we can kind of relate to it that's at least that's how i mean like star trek 6 is an allegory for the end of the cold war so but it wasn't like oh beat you over their head with no it. no no you're right you're definitely right they wouldn't beat you over the head with it and i am afraid that if they remade starman it would definitely be like beat you over the head with something like there would be something to <laughs> turn off the audiences i think if they invested too much money into it i don't think it's such a hot ip that they would that the board i think when the board gets involved with a movie, that's when you start worrying about it. Like, that's look what they get, did to you know, when you that, get a movie with four titles, like Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. Yes, or you get the Disney trilogy. Yeah, because when money's involved, board's gonna get involved. I mean, look at the Mandalorian versus the sequel trilogy. Mandalorian was just like, oh, it's Disney Plus show. We're not even gonna give it that much money. It's gonna be crap anyway. We don't care. Do what you want. And then what happened? It was awesome and now they're trying to shoehorn themselves in oh yeah now they're all like hey so uh we're gonna get involved now so season two was good and now they're probably gonna get involved in season three so oh boy yeah yep. let's hope so i think we're done talking about this film then like we've kind of said everything we wanted to say about it pretty much <laughs> <laughs> i mean I, we've said everything that can be said good film i have the opinion it doesn't need to be remade but here's hoping i don't I mean, think it does I mean, either don't, don't don't think that i'm defending the remake i don't think it needs to be remade but i can see why they're trying to remake it it's one of those things yeah. like it underperformed at the box office i can i can see why they would want to remake it i always scratch my head at the movies that are huge hits that they feel like they need to be remade yeah that it came out like three years ago and they're like let's reboot it what? But it's not even in theaters yet. I mean, we just finished principal photography. Yeah, we need to reboot this. But I, let's can we at least say that so far we're two for two with the uh, the three of us all liking a John Carpenter mo movie? Yeah, yes. he's he's so far been a big hit on the podcast. Yes. Is there any other directors that we've watched so far that have done that? But James Cameron. Yeah, we've liked the Cameron movies we watched. Um, I think. I mean, we overwhelmingly liked this movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was it on aliens it was enjoyable but it wasn't like great especially not great like terminator 2 but yeah this one i would watch this and the thing it's on tv i'm sitting down and paying attention to it yeah i'm just looking at a kind of like a rotten tomatoes siskel and ebert thumbs up or thumbs down like all three of us would give this the thumbs up or the fresh <laughs> rating or whatever you want to call it for sure i would yeah. i would, I would I mean, give this movie an eight on ten yeah, yeah. I, I think that's that's a good rating for it too i would probably do the same yeah, I'm giving this uh, Jeff Bridges thumbs up and middle finger. <laughs> That's from the movie. I see what you did there. Thank you. Also, real quick before we segue out, as um, I don't know if this is good news or bad news, but they are remaking Flight of the Navigator. Yeah, but as a Disney Plus show. Is it a Disney Plus show or are they remaking the uh, for a Disney Plus movie? Uh, 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 Why are you groaning? Uh, I would rather see... Uh, more tv shows like that like serials <laughs> and that's tonight's show as a reminder you can find us on firepitpodcast.com there are links to spotify itunes amazon or wherever fine podcasts are sold i'm still always impressed by our url firepitpodcast.com that always makes me smile. Our regular episodes are Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Please like and subscribe on whatever medium you choose. We really do appreciate it, and it really does help us out. And no one else would help us out if you told people about our podcast. Not only that, you told people to review our podcast. Go on out there. Give it the Jeff Bridges thumbs up middle finger, um, a cherry pie, or an apple cobbler or whatever good review and metric you can think of, 
that'll help people find our podcast, which will then get them to tell more people about that and make us feel, feel real good about ourselves. So do all that. And be sure to join our Discord channel as well. Link in the episode's description at discord.me forward slash firebit. You'll get notifications of new episodes and even better, you can engage in discussions with other fans of the show. And let us know whether or not you want us to keep the quiz section. Um, <laughs> if you say you want us to keep it, you'll promptly be thrown out of the Discord or muted for a day, depending on how petty I'm feeling. Uh, but no, seriously, uh, just come on in. Uh, you get to talk with a lot of our fans that seem to join our discussions almost every episode. Guys like Tarek Thorne, Danielle, Rob, you know, they're all in there talking and uh, letting us know how good or bad or indifferent the episode was to them. So hop on in. It's a fun time. And uh, if you don't want to publicly uh, talk on uh, social medias, you can shoot us a private email at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. There you can just send us a nice long or short message or whatever you're feeling. But you can also like our page on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at FirePitCCE. Both of those are linked in the episode's description. Very nice. And I'd like to start by giving a shout out to two of our Facebook followers, Lyle and Kevin, two of our hundreds and growing numbers who pop into the Facebook page to see what we're up to, see when we post a new episode, see if we uh, put anything of interest such as trivia or movie trailers for the movies we're about to review or have reviewed, or just like having our logo in their favorite section. Whatever it is, thank you for joining and helping to keep the fire pits burning. And I would also like to shout out Audacity. The Audacity is the editing software I utilize every day, every hour, every week to put all of these recordings together make us sound super sweet make our skits fantastic and just make your listening experience as amazing as it is audacity is free software so i am not paying a dime to use it and they are not paying a dime for me to say anything about them but they've worked out for me and if you give them a chance, they might work out for you. And uh, I would like to shout out uh, Peggy, the OG friend of the channel. Uh, always appreciate you listening and feeding, uh, giving us feedback. And I would also like to shout out my family for putting up with multiple recordings this week as we uh, fell behind a little bit. But the three of us had to come together and play catch up. So that was great. My family was incredibly understanding about all that because I record out in the living room. So when I'm recording, they're kind of confined to the back of the apartment. So uh, appreciate that. Um, and then uh, I'd also like to shout out Zencaster, our recording software that we use to record our podcast. Uh, makes life easier, gets better by the day, by the week, it hasn't lost a recording yet, which already makes it the best ever. And just like Audacity, they are not paying us to talk about them and we're not paying them to use the service, but just can't help but giving them a shout out because it is really good software and we really enjoy making the podcast with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are coming up on uh, our 12th journey too. So it's been almost six journeys since we stopped using Skype. Damn. Yeah. Damn. See what happens, Skype, when you lose the best selection section ever. Yep, yep. But um, I would like to shout out, um, you may have heard him in our opening skit. That was not me. That was my son, Colin. So special shout out to Colin for uh, joining us on our uh, episode tonight. He joined us for a little bit of the viewing too, but he didn't say anything. So probably not going to hear him in the watch section. <laughs> but uh, shout out to Colin earlier this week. There, here, here's a little story on why he was in there earlier this week. I was picking him up from school and I had our podcast on as I was just listening to our latest episode to kind of proof it. And he was like, dad, I want to be on your podcast. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Cause he knew I was recording that night. So he requested it and I made sure to make, get him a part in the, uh, Opening skit, and he was very uh, happy about that. So thanks, Colin. Appreciate you coming in, coming on the show. He did a good job, too. He did. Of course, it does open the floodgates to other nieces and nephews being on the show. Oh, yes, yes. Well, I've, I've told my niece that since she's trying to do a Twitter thing, it's like, if she gets 10,000 followers, then we'll talk. 
But uh, also, lastly, I'd like to shout out uh, Sync Lounge and Plex, the software to host our watch sections. They have been uh, exceedingly reliable, very minimal on the uh, technical difficulties lately. So shout out to them for doing a good job uh, what they do. And before we sign off, I would like to give an additional shout out to someone that uh, recently passed away that I was a huge fan of, and that would be Norm MacDonald. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep, yeah. He passed away this week, and uh, most times celebrity deaths don't hit me very hard. But and I'm not saying I I bawled my eyes out when he passed away, but I was sad because he never ceased to make me laugh. Like I found almost everything he did hilarious, especially his work on Saturday Night Live. Which is the oh yeah, movie, I know. loved his weekend updates. Oh yes, and and when he was Burt Reynolds to um, oh, yeah. uh, Will Ferrell's Alex Trebek, Celebrity and, and, Je- yes, Jeopardy, yeah, he was hilarious until he was he was fired from Saturday Night Live, and they brought in the guy to do Sean Connery to play opposite Will Ferrell. Like those were hilarious too. But when he was in the early Celebrity Jeopardy skits as Burt Reynolds, he was pretty goddamn funny. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, you know, special shout out to Norm McDonald. I hope we get to one of your movies someday. So, because like I said, the guy never ceased to make me laugh. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Good call on that shout out. Yeah. Cause I was thinking about that this week too. Yeah, I thought he was hilar- great in, uh, the Orville, which apparently he was able to finish all of his scenes for season three coming up this year, next oh, year. Yeah. Mm. What, what was he in the Orville? Was he the slime? He thing? was the, yeah, he was the, uh, gelatinous, uh, ooze character. Oh. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he was hilarious in that role. So, yeah, I, I love Norm MacDonald. I was very sad to see him go. I got to agree with you, Dan. I was very shocked when I, I was reading the headlines that he passed. Yeah, yeah. I, but uh, that's all I've got to say tonight. So, Tom, take us out of here. All right. Um, well, I don't know where to take us out to, guys. Um, where are we going well, to next? Well, um, guys, 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 the l- next next movie we're watching is The Last Picture on this podcast so next week's our last movie that we are watching so it's our final episode episode 81 it's the last picture show that we're gonna have on oh. this episode so we had a good run you know but i think did. 81's a good one to have the last picture show so yeah so I, that's a great one yeah yeah good so yeah, stay tuned I, for our final episode next week as we watch our last picture show Oh, no, I think you mean The Last Picture Show, Josh. Oh, that's the name of the movie we're watching. First Base. What? What? We're watching The Last Picture Show. (laughs) Until then, I've been Tom. I've been Dan. I've been Josh. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Good luck out there. I mean, at least we don't have to worry about the sex jokes anymore. Ah, who am I kidding? This sucks. Yeah, he's still a bossy, condescending jerk, just like the original Josh, but now he makes us do actual work. Plus, now he's getting all super old and disgusting. Ew. And once you are done cleaning up these corpses, I need you to collect them and migrate them over to the marriage counselor. Oh, Oh, dear God. I then need you to bring all of your tax forms for me to review for the internal revenue. Now, what is this gaudy can here on the floor? There are hundreds of them about. White claw. Is this a euphemism for some kind of a street drug? This one is unopened. I shall open it. Hmm. This has an interesting taste. Hmm. What is this? You know, know what? what? Never, Never mind. mind. Your species isn't, isn't worth it. it. Have, Have fun destroying yourselves, morons. morons. I'm, I'm out of here. <gasps> hey guys, what's up? Josh? Josh? We thought you were dead. No, I fell off the thing because I couldn't make the jump. It was like 20 feet. And I was dangling there for like four hours. You douchebags just left. You said you were dying. Of hunger. Oh. You could have just said that. But I did. So anywho, what did I miss? The usual. So wait, you were dangling for four hours, but you've been gone for two weeks. Well, I... No, no, that joke only works if you don't overthink it. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Works for me. Perfect. Cut. Print.